I find myself on this platform here today to try and see how India could become in the true sense a knowledge economy. We need to put knowledge to use for the well-being of the nation, for the well-being of society. And you know, I'm a mathematician and mathematicians Whenever they define a concept, they illustrate with examples. I want you to look at these examples to draw your own insights and conclusions on how you could take yourselves forward in your own lives and careers. There is a whole world out there which beckons us if we hark to the lessons of history. And so I'd like to refer to history, and I talk of my nation's history primarily, to let you see how a knowledge economy works and what is the meaning of a knowledge economy. You know, I'll let you into something that you may or may not know. When I was in school, I was taught that Vasco de Gama discovered the sea route to India. And I honestly believe that. It was there in my history textbook. I do not know what they teach now. I believe they may have corrected it. But that's what I believed, because I was taught that. It was a Harvard scholar sometime in 2009 or 10, from whose own researches and personal interactions I learned that the sea route to India was known to Indians for centuries before the time of Vasco da Gama. So what did Vasco da Gama do? He comes into Africa, I think it was Mozambique, I'm not sure, and he picks up this navigator from Gujarat by the name of Kana. And Kana takes Vasco da Gama's ship and traverses the Indian Ocean unerringly straight into Kerala. And how could Kana do that? Because he had a device with him called the Rappel guy. The other name for the Rappel guy is Kamal. This was a device coming out of knowledge systems in India. It's a device based on a mathematical idea. And that allows you to determine position at sea. And so Indian ships could navigate the high seas, both on the eastern seaboard and the western seaboard, unerringly and reach their destination with efficiency and speed and security and return. How does this help the economy? Well, I'll tell you how it helps the economy. Much before all this, when Newton tells the British Parliament the science knows no means of determining position at sea. And why does he say that? Because Britain had set forth a huge prize, a financial prize, for anyone who could find a way of determining position at sea. Why was it important? Because trade would largely happen, significantly happen through sea routes. And European ships were consistently getting lost getting affected by storms and would lose millions and millions of pounds of worth of goods and merchandise. And so the British and other nations were concerned about finding means of determining position at sea. While Newton says that science no mean, knows no means of determining position at sea, here was India for hundreds of years even before Newton having figured out a mathematical way of determining position at sea. Of course, much later when the Europeans invented, you know, the other device which allows them to find position at sea, that's a far more secure thing, a better thing. But all these centuries, India knew how to do this. And how does it help the nation? Well, here's what Pliny, the Roman historian, records before the time of Christ, that India is taking away all our gold. So Indian ships come with goods from India, unhindered, undamaged, trade with the Romans, with goods that are manufactured in India, 
and return without any harm and in process take away Roman gold. And Pliny is complaining about that. And what was it that they were bringing? The fact that they could come there with efficiency and accuracy. Indian ships used to be better built so they could survive the perils of the high seas. But what was it that they were bringing? So here's something else I want you to know. You know, when Alexander invaded India, again, before the time of the Christ, you may perhaps know that he did not cross the river Bias. What we were told in history was that his soldiers were tired and they wanted to go back. But here's the Indian version of this history and a recorded genuine version coming from our own sources that when he reached the Bias River, and till then he had been undefeated, when he reached the Bias River, his spies crossed the river and then returned to tell him that they had seen this vast Magadan army, thousands of horses, thousands of elephants, and many, many more foot soldiers. And they told Alexander, as history has been recorded in our sources, that the Indian Magadan army soldiers are waiting eagerly to give you battle. And that's when he decided to turn back. And when he turned back, he was demoralized. And on his way back, he met his now friend, King Porus Pururaj. And Porus cheered him up when he gifted Alexander several ingots of the wood's steel. What was the wood's steel and why would Alexander be cheered up? I'm sure some of you have heard of what is called the Damascus sword or the Damascene Talwar. The Damascus sword was famous the world over. Everyone wanted this sword. What many of us do not know is that for centuries, this sword, which was given shape in Damascus, was really nothing but the wood's steel from India. And its value was as good as gold. No other country could manufacture it. And so the wood's steel would be exported from India by ship, by the land route. What was so special? Because India was a world leader in metallurgy. So it could produce a steel that no other country could do. This is knowledge being put to use for the welfare of the nation's economy. That brought in huge amounts of gold. And that's what cheered Alexander when Porus gave him these ingots of wood's steel. Now, these are two prime examples of how knowledge is being put to use for the welfare of society. You have knowledge in some knowledge system. That knowledge is put to use in society. You create the wood steel, you find safe routes on sea, and then you trade and you bring back wealth. And that's how India became such a wealthy nation. That's one of the main reasons. And that's what is meant by a knowledge economy. You put knowledge to use for the well-being of society. And that has been the Indian tradition for centuries. We have a very ancient school of philosophy called the Mimansa School of Philosophy. It says categorically, knowledge without action is meaningless. But somewhere along the way, not too long ago, 200 years ago, maybe a little more, India seems to have lost its way. Our knowledge systems lost faith in themselves. And we lost the basic principles of what knowledge really means and how one could use it for the well-being of society. Yet, India continues to do well, and I will tell you, in a short while. But we need to recalibrate ourselves, correct our direction, and re-energize ourselves to become a proper knowledge economy. And what do we see in today's world? You must have heard of the firm Google. What is the power of Google? Where does it come from? That's a prime example in today's world of what is a knowledge economy. When Google was 10 years old, I looked at its financial statements. I also looked at the financial statements 
of the top four IT firms of India. We're called an IT superpower. At that point in time, Google had only 10,000 employees. It was just 10 years old. One of our IT firms at that time was 80 years old and had almost 100,000 employees. And all these four IT firms together, their financial revenue for one year put together was less than what Google was making in one quarter. Do you see the point I'm trying to make? That is the power of a knowledge system. What does Google do? Google uses undergraduate level mathematics. Finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, taught at undergraduate level, in almost every good Indian institution, across the board. It uses good coding. Aren't we all very good at coding? And yet, till today, we haven't been able to do anything that could match what this undergraduate level ideas, which are highly innovative, highly inventive, have done for Google. And you can check the figures of revenue even today for Google and compare it to any of our IT firms and you will see a stark contrast. Because Google is driven by a knowledge idea. On the other hand, you look at what our firms are doing and this is where I have faith and hope amongst all of you. India has yet to invent its own coding language. And let's not worry too much. Now there are other devices and tools available to us. There is artificial intelligence, which is making progress in leaps and bounds. We need to hark to that. If you think Google is some solitary example, let me, let me disabuse you of that belief. You know, in 2012, there was this major scholarly study on the geographical region around Stanford University, just Stanford University, and the region around it. And they looked at its economic output. And in 2012, it was more than $3 trillion. And if you think Stanford is an isolated example, Think again. Harvard has similar things around its own geographical region. MIT has the same standing. You have the Imperial College, same situation. You look at Cambridge, the fastest growing economic region in all of Great Britain today is the geographical region around Cambridge University. The most, one of the most successful drugs in the history of pharmacy has come from Cambridge University. And that has brought wealth not just to Cambridge University, not just to the inventors, not just to the firm, but to the country. Now we need to ask ourselves, can we think of one economic region around one knowledge system in India that could be a fraction of what these institutions are doing? And I'm afraid, not yet. We have a long way to go. 2012, Stanford generates an economic might of $3 trillion. The entire Indian economy is a little more than $3 trillion now. But I'm not saying this to demoralize you. I want you to understand that India has begun to find its way. Yesterday's talk by Dr. Kota Hari Narayana is one of those prime examples the Tejas aircraft is a wonderful illustration of how our own indigenous knowledge systems have been put to use. And is it going to bring wealth to India? I have reason to believe it has begun to do so already. I don't know how many of you are aware, Dr. Kota was a very modest man and he doesn't like to talk about his own personal conquests in the realm of knowledge. But do you know that Tejas has its own indigenously designed compact oxygen supply system, which is entirely Indian? And from the time of COVID, Tejas systems have been available to our hospitals and such places to generate oxygen to combat COVID. 
and now it is being marketed all across India and possibly even the world. The Tejas has invented its own computer-based maneuverability system that is remarkable. It is in speed. I had a discussion with Dr. Kota last night and he said speed is not as important as this business of how well an aircraft can maneuver itself. And Tejas has designed a remarkable new highly inventive system all indigenous. And how is it going to bring well-being even as you and I sit here and talk? India is trying to sell Tejas aircraft to Argentina. Talks are underway. Guess who our competitors are? The United States and China. And why is this happening? Why is India capable of doing that? Because our knowledge system, Tejas uses indigenous knowledge. Our knowledge systems have produced something. What is the issue of concern here? As I discussed with Dr. Kota yesterday, and as many of us, Kavi and my Vice Chancellor colleagues, all of us are aware, our regular, standard, organized knowledge systems are yet to catch the bus. We seem to be oblivious. What do I mean by that? And that is what I want you to do, to take this message forward, to make knowledge work for society, for you, for your future, and for the nation. What do I mean by that? We teach a subject called fluid dynamics. You cannot build the Tejas if you don't use fluid dynamics. You cannot build any aircraft if you don't use fluid dynamics. And fluid dynamics is taught in every institution in India that deals with maths or physics or engineering related to aeronautics. The tragedy is, and I will illustrate this tragedy with a genuine real world example. In 2011, I was addressing a bunch of 40 students of mathematics, all of whom had studied fluid dynamics. And I asked them, I have a project in fluid dynamics and how many of you would like to work on it? And not one hand was raised. And then I said, I have a project to build a fighter aircraft. How many of you would like to work on it? And every hand went up. I was talking of the same project. Those young students were unaware that the fluid dynamics that they have used is what I'm talking about. It can be used to build fighter aircraft or any other aircraft. Why? Because our knowledge systems are yet to energize themselves to connect knowledge to the real world. Why is that happening? And that is where India needs to wake up. Because we must recognize that unless we connect knowledge systems to the needs and challenges of society, we will not be able to make India a genuine knowledge economy. We teach fluid dynamics on the blackboard. There are no wind tunnels, no models of aeronautical devices, nothing to connect. Forget everything else. I have yet to come across a single fluid dynamics class lecture in any part of India where they ask students to record the way an eagle or a falcon lands through their smartphones in video form so that they could understand a little bit of the fluid dynamic based aerodynamical principles that they study on the blackboard. Not one experiment have I come across. Perhaps you study this. Perhaps you could go back. Perhaps you could ask your teachers, why are you not allowed to do this hands-on learning? Why are you not allowed to do things with your hands all the time. Knowledge without action is meaningless. That is what the Mimansa school has said centuries ago. But if you think it's only the Mimansa school, everywhere that I have gone, and the Tony Blair Foundation has submitted a report recently which says the best pedagogy is that which deals with problems of the real world in a practical, problem-solving, project-based manner in groups. And all prescriptions of the national education policy say exactly that. And wherever we have put it to use, it has given us enormous dividends, enormous dividends. 
At the Innovation Center at Delhi University in 2011, we admitted the first batch of students in BTEC, Innovation with Mathematics and IT. Within one year, a bunch of undergraduates came up with an extremely original idea based on the project-based learning that they were doing. Almost all the learning there happens through projects, the way Kavi does. Unfortunately, Kavi is still outside these regular systems, but I take heart from the fact that all such members of regular systems of study hark to Kavi. In exactly the same way, we had a formal system there, but the pedagogy was project-based. And these three youngsters, there were others, I'm giving you just one illustration from the first batch, within one year came up with a startup idea using the knowledge that they had put to use through their hands. And right now, that is a multi-million dollar enterprise in Silicon Valley. And that was started in 2011 by undergraduates who were just one year out of high school. I want you to realize your own power. They were just like you. All youth everywhere in the world are blessed. They have to look within and they have to energize themselves. And how do you inspire yourselves? And I urge you to take this message back. Our systems of learning, especially because of the national education policy, once again I repeat, must be connected to the needs and challenges of the nation, of society. And this is how knowledge gains. Look at the Nobel Prize in Medicine of this year. It has gone to this lady who worked in a university system even though she did not have a tenured job. The mRNA vaccine is her idea. But when COVID happened, I looked at many university systems across the world and as I expected, the leading ones were making their own contributions. Oxford created its own vaccine. Imperial College created its own efforts to make a vaccine. They were all contributing in some way or the other. Our knowledge systems dealing with these ideas did not at that time rise to the challenge. But that is why I address you not to demoralize but to recognize that these are the challenges that you must bring into your fold. Those who are here as faculty, hark to these words. Go back and say that the national education policy asks you to do this repeatedly. It gives you the freedom to devise your curriculum to the needs and challenges of the nation and of society through projects where students in groups work in collaborative fashion, which makes it transdisciplinary, hands-on, with entrepreneurial ideas as a byproduct. And India will rise again and become a knowledge economy. The future is in your hands. That is why Dr. Arya, I, so many other colleagues have taken the trouble. We look towards you who are the future, the kind of training you are getting now, the kind of ideas that are being embedded in your minds. Take these forward, distribute them as much as you can and help India to find its rightful place in the world again. Thank you very much. Jai Hind.